message today is the scandal of grace. Grace shouldn't be a scandal. The scandal is that God saves those who don't deserve it. That's what scandalizes some people. Jesus sees the potential in every person and can call anyone to his service. With God, anyone can change if they want to change. God doesn't force his will on us. No one deserves change. God is compassionate and full of grace. It says in Exodus 34, 6 through 7, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. He just doesn't let things slide. He says, Nehemiah says of God, you are a God of forgiveness, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. See, God can both uphold justice and forgive sinners because his justice has been satisfied by his son who died as a substitute for sinners. Can a thief on the cross find forgiveness as he is dying? Yes. Can a murderer find forgiveness? Yes. Can a mass murderer find forgiveness? Yes, if they want forgiveness. The message of the gospel centers on the truth that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. The Bible is clear that salvation not, cannot be earned. You can't be good enough. Personal works, personal effort of any form. There is no self-righteousness. The human achievement cannot obtain salvation. It's like a filthy garment. Only the di divine power can accomplish and provide forgiveness for sin and hope of eternal life. It is very simply stated, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, not by effort, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. He saves us with the purpose of being a good person. He has changed us. When Jesus showed no interest in conforming to these non-biblical rules that the Pharisees and restrictions that they had set up and the scribes and the Sadducees, they accused him of not being holy. They scorned him by calling him a friend of tax collectors and sinners. See, they couldn't have said anything in their circles that was more divisive. They were calling him an enemy of God. What the Pharisees regarded as scandal in reality is the ultimate dis 
demonstration of God's grace toward undeserving sinners. And that's what this passage is about. Jesus is calling the outcasts, the people that don't fit in, the nobodies. Mark chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. See, Jesus is promising forgiveness, and it includes inviting a tax collector to join his apostolic band. Every person must choose between faith and salvation or rejection of faith and salvation. Salvation is for everyone, and Jesus gives even the social outcasts, the lowlifes, an opportunity. See, he sees potential in every person. He knows their heart, and he can call anyone into his service. Chapter 2, verses 13 through 17 of the Gospel of Mark. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. And as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While well, Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, Many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When they saw Levi get up and follow Jesus, they began to follow Jesus. And when the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus went out beside the lake. This is a, a frequent phrase in the Gospel of Mark when he's living in Capernaum. He is choosing another person to follow him. Whether it is one of the 12, some people think it is, some people aren't sure. Some have suggested that Levi was Matthew's second name, or perhaps that Matthew was a Levite. And most people who were Levites in the first century, who were named Levi, were priests. In that case, Matthew would have been especially hated by his countrymen as one who should have pursued a religious vocation, but chose a despised one instead. A large crowd came to him. And we see polar opposites here. The people are flocking to Jesus. And at the same time, the leaders begin to oppose him more and more intently. He saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. It doesn't tell us where that booth is, but Capernaum was on the Via Maris, M-A-R-I-S. And the Via Maris, if you Google it, it's a famous road. It's a Roman road from Damascus all the way to Memphis, not Tennessee, Memphis, Egypt. So from Damascus, through Capernaum, 
down to the shore by Dor and Jaffa. Jaffa is the place that uh, Jonah got into the boat. It goes all the way to Memphis. That is the road. It's presumed by some that this booth was the customs booth on the Via Maris or associated with trade that was going through this route. It had to do with trade goods and tariffs, the kind of things we're talking about about international trade today. And these people were despised because they consorted with the Romans and were allowed to add whatever surcharge they wished. The Romans wanted so much for bringing goods into the area. The tax collector's job was to collect that. But he also had sticky, greasy fingers and he could add whatever he want for his pockets. And because the tax collectors greed and collusion with their enemies, the Jews hated them. They were lowlifes. They were working for the other team. They were working for the enemy. It's a lot like the, du the, uh, the sticky greasiness of, of working with the mafia or working with the, um, the cartel. If you don't think the cartel is active here, you just haven't seen it yet. I know people that grew up in it. I worked with kids in high school that died or their grandparents or their uncles died because of the cartel and I was helping them through grief. But see, it's this shadow underground relationships that made the tax collector so dirty. And because they were doing this, it made them feel dumb, in a sense. See, when you follow a legalist, you don't have to think. You simply learn the rules and blindly obey them. You don't know why they're the rules, you just obey it. That's what legalism does. It shuts down thinking. It shuts down reasoning in and applying things to life. Where Christianity, according to Paul in, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Giving ourselves, our total selves to God is our act of worship. But do not conform, verse 2, to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, changed, metamorphosed by the renewing of your mind. See how we really change as people is because we have forgiveness and we allow God to change our mind and our heart. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And many of these tax collectors and sinners were eating with Jesus. It was common in Palestine or Israel of the first century that the participants 
would take on Roman customs because Rome was running the show. That's how the, the real movers and shakers did it. So they reclined on couches around a small table that had food. Just that setting, it was so different than the Jewish setting, that caused problems with the legalists. But now Jesus is there with tax collectors and other sinners, notorious thieves, prostitutes, people of a shady reputation. Jesus did this kind of thing often. It's not just one time we see it here in Mark. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus comes across another tax collector, Zacchaeus. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house. So he came down at once and he welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter, he is gone to be the guest of a sinner? But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That is why Jesus came, to, to seek and to save the lost. And that's how, what Jesus' his effort and purpose was in hanging out with these people outside of the center of religious life in Israel. And there were so many of them, they even say in verse 15, there were many of them, and they were following him. Not only were the, the average person following him, but the sinners were following him. We would have expected that the people of God would rejoice at seeing tax collectors and thieves coming to Christ. Where are they going to get their treatment that they needed, unless it was from Jesus? But it was very evident that Jesus was deliberately associating himself with outcasts of Jewish society. To even call a tax collector to be his follower was brash crazy. He had made it clear that he had come to convert the sinners, not compliment the self-righteous. Some of you have seen the TV show, The Office. In an episode from the third season, Michael Scott, played by Steve Carell, is being interviewed for a position at the Dunder Mifflin corporate headquarters in New York City. The interview presents a humorous picture of, of just how deep and pervasive human pride is. The interviewer says, so let me ask you a question right off the bat. What do you think are your greatest strengths as a manager? Michael says, why don't you, why don't I tell you my greatest weaknesses? First, I work hard, I care too much, and sometimes I can be too invested in my job. The interview was kind of taken back. Okay, and your strengths? Michael said, 
Well, my weaknesses are actually my strengths. And needless to say, Michael was not hired for the position. See, sadly, many people are like Michael Scott. The Pharisees were. They were unwilling to see their own weaknesses, their own failure, their own sin, and their own need for Jesus. See, we have to be aware of our weaknesses and turn to the Savior. The teachers of the law, who were the Pharisees, see, everything about them, what this group of people were doing with Jesus was wrong in their eyes. They could see no right in this situation. These people were eating food that was un, was cooked improperly. It wasn't kosher. The setting was not according to protocol. They were hanging out with people who were impure, ceremonially unclean. Had they washed their hands? The list could go on. But see, he only cared about reaching the sick. See, the Pharisees, they tried to build a fence, a wall around the law to help people not get entrapped in difficulty. So instead of, you know, you, you should not murder, you, sh you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do this to, to prevent you from, don't argue with your wife, that kind of thing. They shun contact and especially sharing meals with people who were not religious in order to avoid any problems with impurity. William Barclay, the commentator, put it this way. To the Jews, religion was a thing of endless rules. People lived their lives in an endless forest of regulation, which dictated every action. They must listen forever to, voice, to a voice which said, you shall not. There was a lot of thou shalt nots. But how did Jesus deal with these bullies, these thugs, these religious thugs? He took them on face to face. He refused to back down. He modeled a grace-oriented message. He refused to be manipulated by them. Others ran scared, but not Jesus. See, legalism is an attitude of authoritarianism. It is a desire to control other people by enforcing an exhaustive list of do's and don'ts that attempts to define a, 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 what's good behavior and what's bad behavior. In the 50s and 60s, there were groups in our country that you couldn't roller skate because you couldn't dance. You didn't want to go to places that people might think bad of you. Legalism emphasizes the letter of the law to exclude the spirit or the intent of the law. It's a public piety. If you look up the word legalist in the Cambridge Dictionary, someone who follows the law very closely, especially by paying more attention to rules and details than to the intentions behind them. And another way of looking at it, it is institutionalized narcissism. The people who were legalists have a grandiose sense of their self-importance. 
They have fantasies about having or, or deserving respect. They have a sense of self-superiority. They have a need for excessive admiration. We see this in the Pharisees. They love to be seen praying in public. They had a sense of entitlement. They were, had exploitive behavior. They lacked empathy. And they frequently envied others. And there was arrogance. See, legalism is in essence spiritual narcissism. Chuck Swindoll says, make no mistake about it. Legalism is an enemy. Legalism isn't a well-meaning but misguided friend, but rather an aggressive opponent to the life of joy, the walk of faith, and the liberty in Christ. Legalism is a thief stealing our freedom from us and robbing us of spontaneous joy. Legalism is a bully, intimidating all those who don't know how to defend themselves. It is a grim-faced, guilt-giving, self-appointed judge who indicts and pronounces shame and condemnation on all who refuse to obey its ridiculous lists of non-biblical rules and man-made regulations. See, it is for the healthy that Jesus it's not for the healthy that Jesus came. It is for the sick. And it's not the righteous that are self-perceive themselves as healthy. They are the ones who are really unhealthy. I have come to call the righteous, not to call the righteous, but sinners. He is calling the people who realize they need God. The ones who know that they are ill. Human prejudice has no place in God's kingdom. That is his mission. Salvation is for all. And there is a special place in God's heart for those whom society has rejected. God sees not only the sin in us, but the potential for good in each of us. If you haven't stepped toward God by faith, take that step. If you have stepped out in faith to follow God, he may be asking you to take an additional step. Is God speaking to your heart? Jesus dealt with this with the Pharisees. Paul dealt with this in Galatian, Galatia, and, and he expressed his thoughts in the book of Galatians. He says, we do not yield in subjection to them for even an hour, Galatians 2.5. Or as the, the message says, we didn't give them the time of day. Enjoy your freedom in spite of the legalists who want to take your freedom away. Don't be afraid. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it is a treatise on freedom in Christ. See, what was happening in Galatia is that the Judaizers were coming and telling the people in the church that you had to be circumcised. You, you have to be a good Jew before you can follow Christ. And Paul said that's not true. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you, 
that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. See, Jesus didn't consider some people rejects, broken beyond repair. He is the dear and glorious physician who comes to heal and to restore and to transform and to forgive. He comes to us in our need and he gives us exactly what we need. There are three kinds of patients whom Jesus cannot heal of their sin and sickness. Those who don't know about him. If a person doesn't know about Jesus, there's no way they're going to find healing. And those who, who know about him but refuse to trust him, if they refuse to trust him, there's nothing he can do to help them. And those who will not admit that they need him and see, the scribes and the Pharisees were in this category. They refused to, to state that they needed him. See, unless we admit that we are sinners deserving of God's judgment, we cannot be saved. God saves only sinners. Jesus sees the potential in each of us and can call any of us to follow him and to serve him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. Some have never followed you. We pray that they would step up, put their faith in you, that you can change them, that you can forgive them. You see the failures and sins of their past. You see their weakness as you've seen mine, and you've forgiven, as you did Levi and Zacchaeus, and all that have known you throughout the centuries. We thank you, Lord, that you can cleanse and forgive us and forget, because Christ died for our sins, and he was buried and rose again on the third day. And with that, we live rejoicing, looking forward to his return. In Christ's name we pray, amen.